everyone. Welcome to Just Read It. I'm Caroline Miller, your host. This is a, ca- a broadcast coming out of Portland, Oregon, where Northwest writers spend a lot of time talking about the New York Times bestseller books. But every once in a while, we break from that and we actually get ourselves a real live <laughs> New York Times bestseller writer. And today, is one of those days. And today with us is uh, Rebecca Morris, uh, who is uh, more than one time New York Times bestseller. Uh, We're gonna talk a little bit about her book, Boy Missing, but she's written many, many others. Uh, Boy Missing is her latest, but uh, perhaps you've read Killing an Amish Country and the mystery of a missing child and her neighbor and her neighbor Ted Bundy. So that will tell you a little something about that. She's a veteran broadcaster. I've been aware of her for many years and a print journalist. And she appears on network and cable television as as a crime expert. And she also lives in Seattle and uh, uh, teaches. And at the moment, she's working on her first novel. So Welcome, Rebecca. It's lovely to have you here. Well, thank you, Caroline. It's so good to see you again and talk to you again. And I used to cover you when you were a politician in Portland, Oregon. I was looking, working for a news radio station. So uh, we both come a long way since then. I remember you lurking in the back of the oh, hall yes. with that little camera. Uh, 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 record or something. Yes. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I did a lot of lurking with the tape recorder. <laughs> yeah. yeah, sure. It's quite a change to what you're doing now. Well, now, Rebecca, you've you've won a lot of awards. Actually, you've written some some fiction. Uh, uh, short stories were they or? No, I really hadn't uh, written any fiction. I have a I have an MFA in playwriting, so I I, I sometimes have, have gone back to playwriting. But I, uh, you know, was a journalist, both broadcasting and print. I moved, uh, I was a reporter on 9-11 in New York uh, in radio and moved back to Seattle 15 years ago. And I was freelancing for the Seattle Times and um, also working in TV news in Seattle. And I stumbled on a story I wrote about for the Seattle Times that turned into my first book. And I had no idea I would be, you know, grow up to be a true crime writer in my 50s and 60s. But that's what I focused on uh, for about the last 12 years. And I I find it a pretty fascinating subject. Now, what was this first uh, piece that you wrote that you stumbled Mm -hmm. across? Is it was it did it turn out to be a book? Well, it it did, because I realized there'd never been a book about it. There was a child that was went missing from her Tacoma, Washington home in 1961. So it was 60 years uh, this last Labor Day, a couple of weeks ago. She was never found. Um, I was writing a story about how do families cope when they never have an ending. I, I don't like the word closure myself. I think the media throws it around. Uh, I don't think we wake up one day and suddenly, you know, we have closure. But her mother was um, still living, and I spent a year interviewing uh, Beverly Burr in her in her Tacoma home when she was about eighty years old. Oh. And uh, so the book is about Anne Marie Burr, who was eight years old when she disappeared, but also another family in Tacoma, because at the time Anne disappeared, Ted Bundy was a fourteen year old who uh, I found mutual friends they had who said that Ted knew Ann and Ann knew Ted, even though there was an age gap between them. And when he was on death row in Florida, he confessed to the crime, speaking in the third person. He confessed to a researcher and later to some journalists exactly how that crime, his first crime took place. And he wouldn't uh, more more openly or candidly admit it, but he described it in the third person. He also said, you know, your first murder is very special. It's very personal. You keep it close to you because it's the first one. And especially if that first murder is a child. And a lot of people have forgotten 
that over Ted Bundy's career, he did kill other children. Uh, his very last victim in Florida was a 12-year-old girl. Oh. And he also killed a 14-year-old in, in Idaho. Uh, so I ended up, I didn't set out to do a book about Ted Bundy, but it became a book about the two families in Tacoma, the family of the missing girl and, and then Ted Bundy uh, uh, as uh, sort of how their lives uh, overlapped. And then and then the last, uh, you know, when you set out to do a book about somebody like Ted Bundy, you have to find something new to say. Oh, and true. what had never really been written about much is his childhood and his youth. And then the very end of his life with the psychiatrist and the journalists and uh, the detectives and his, la his pro bono attorney at the end of his life. And I was really interested in what he said at the end of his life about his crimes. And uh, so I, I found, I think, some new angles and, uh, on, on Ted Bundy. So that was my first book. And it opened, it opened some doors, frankly. I, I can't imagine, Rebecca, that until you, no one was curious about the childhood of this man. You know, yeah. it's extraordinary, isn't it? Yes. And a few people had, uh, well, very few had really touched on his childhood. The thing about Ted Bundy is there have been so many myths over the years. It was very hard to sort out, let's see, you know, 40 years since he was executed, 30 years, you know, exactly what was, what was a myth and what wasn't. Um, so I spent four years on that book. And that's, that's when I learned that uh, nonfiction takes a long time. It's, it's a lot of work uh, to take a look at what other people have written or not written and, and do interviews and do a reg original research. Well, uh, I want to get into that in our discussion, but let's, let's start out with your latest book, mm -hmm. Going Missing. This is right in my backyard, Portland, Oregon. Chiron Foreman was a, a, mm -hmm. a, a elementary school child. And mm -hmm. yes. Off one day to uh, attend a well a science uh, fair at his school. I think he had some mm -hmm. exhibit. And, he did, and then um, he never came back from school. Can you yeah. tell us about that? And why did this particular tr crime particularly catch your eye? Because uh, this this is about a ten year old case, isn't it? Uh, now it's 11 years. Yeah, it yeah. was uh, um, 2010. Uh, well, this is a case where I'd watched this for many years. You know, not every story or case that happens is, is ready for a book. Usually publishers want adjudication. And of course, there has been none in this case because his body's never been found. And after watching this case for eight or nine years and realizing that it might never be, you know, quote, solved, unquote, uh, I, I thought it was time to tell the story. And I wrote Kyron's mother, Desiree Young in uh, Medford, Oregon, um, a letter, an old fashioned letter. And I explained uh, why I wanted to talk with her and write about Kyron. And She'd had other authors uh, uh, write to her and visit her. And, but she, I had um, a few years ago written a book about Susan Powell, who is still missing in Utah, young Mormon mother. Um, her husband took the kids in the back of the van. They took Susan out in a, a blizzard in Utah, and he left her somewhere or put her down a mine or, you know, she's never been found. He moved back to Puyallup, Washington with his kids. And then in 2012, killed his children and himself. So I wrote that book, which is called If I Can't Have You, uh, which is about Susan Powell. And so, and Anne-Marie Burr was a missing person that's never been found. So one of the things I could tell Desiree Young, Kyron's mother, is that, you know, how I win, it really worked to win the trust of families so that I can help them to tell their story. And I think that resonated with her. So I began working on uh, the Kyron Horman book, I believe in uh, 2000, 
18. So uh, that was a case that had been widely reported around the world and, and especially in Portland. Uh, he was a seven-year-old, a second grader. His stepmother had taken him to school that morning early. There was a science fair. His science project was about the red tree frog that he had worked on hard. Um, she says that she left him at school. Uh, he was missing for six hours before he was reported missing. There are witnesses who saw her leave the school with him, get in her husband's white pickup truck. And she also had a 19 month old baby girl. And then the stepmother, Terry Mormon, is missing for about the next two hours. Mm -hmm. So uh, later she went home and she posted a picture of uh, Kyron on Facebook with his science project. And then Kyron's father came home and they walked to the school bus and there's no Kyron. So it was a, a very late in the game, six or eight hours before police were notified that he was missing. So she said she left him at school. Uh, he, was, he was not at school. And he was actually recorded as not being at school, but the teacher thought he had a doctor's appointment and that's why he was gone. And it was all very calculated on the stepmother's part. I, I can say that because that's what Multnomah County Sheriff's Office says. And, uh, and Desiree Young. So it, it was a very complicated story. Um, that same summer that, that Kyron disappeared, uh, they found out the stepmother tried to hire somebody to kill her husband. It just, it, it just kept on, the strangest things kept on happening. And um, what, this is the one book that I will say I decided I had a cause that I wanted to include in the book. You know, I don't think, I don't think uh, nonfiction or true crime that it's not, a, not about the author and it's not about, you know, uh, really, really, uh, you know, a, a cause. But I thought that after, after several books and three books with missing people, um, I wanted to call attention to literally what are called no body cases. And that's what Susan Powell is. And that's what Kyron Horman is. There's no body. They haven't found the body. So prosecutors won't bring charges, won't bring criminal charges, almost always until there's a body found. Oh, well, because, let, me, let me interrupt here. Because, yes. Because I think, or maybe I'm going to the point that you want to make, because I, I read in another interview that you said that sometimes it's, easier to prosecute when there's no body than people think. Is that correct? Or? Well, it's not necessarily easier, but I found, you know, there's one expert in the world who's in America who tracks no body convictions and no body prosecutions, I should say. And actually the conviction rate is better with no body cases than normal murder cases. And, and so the end of the book is kind of about how, why it's time to re-examine that and that, that charges can be brought usually. And, and okay, is there, are there any, any statistics on that? I mean, how, well, there, there are. And so the, the end of Boy Missing, the search for Kyron Horman, uh, uh, gets gets into that what the percentages are and and literally he he keeps track of uh, what cases in what states mm -hmm. have been prosecuted and which cases have been successfully prosecuted and it's very um, hit and miss because uh, sometimes again uh, because of double jeopardy a uh -oh. district attorney won't bring charges for instance if they charged Terry Horman in this case without a body and she was found innocent, then if, when they find Chiron, she couldn't be charged again. I see. So, you know, they, they think that it's better to wait. Uh, so that's become uh, a cause for me that I, I care very, very much about that. Uh, let's, let's try to, let's try to 
find a way. And, you know, with Josh Powell, if they'd found a way to arrest him, you know, for people say, why didn't they arrest him for jaywalking? And maybe I'm not sure they would have found Susan then, but um, um, I'll tell you quickly about a new book I'm working on. Um, So Susan Powell's parents, Chuck and Judy Cox and Hugh Allop, recently won a huge lawsuit against the state of Washington uh, that found a jury found uh, the Department of Health and Social Services and Child Protective Services culpable in the murder of her children who were five and seven years old in 2012 when their father was on a custody visit, uh, hit them with an ax and lit them on fire and burned up the house. Oh. So the Child Protective Service workers were warned that Chuck, that Josh was was a threat, and uh, so a jury agreed with the Coxes that this could have been prevented. Mm-hmm. So the judge in the case is now uh, appealing the amount of the award, but the they can't appeal the jury's verdict, which was guilty for the state of Washington. So Chuck Cox and I are doing a book about the trial and about. Uh, child protective services in Washington state and, and, you know, what needs to be fixed so that the children in a, in a, in a dangerous situation where their parent is a suspect in a murder or a person of interest, maybe they shouldn't be able to have custodial visits. Mm -hmm. Maybe they should be in a more secure location when they see their parents. So in the Horman case, what you were doing, picking up this uh, 10-year-old story that's now 11, uh, it was uh, turning up some dirt, if you will, to see if you can find some new dirt. <laughs> I want to get back to a point you just made, and, and that is um, approaching uh, the parents mm-hmm. of the child mm-hmm. that has been, mm-hmm. uh, 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 how do you uh, gain mm-hmm. their trust? How, how do you mm-hmm. do that? What, mm-hmm. What's your approach? Well, very quickly, I wanna say, I don't, I don't think of myself as digging up dirt and I don't, I don't set out to solve the case. I don't think that's the author's, I, I don't think that should be in the ten, intention. It's not, it's not to solve a case. It's to tell the story. Uh-huh. And certainly Good. I found when you do a book and it was three years on the Kyron Harmon case, you, you learn more than a newspaper could have ever possibly, you know, it's very helpful to have the newspaper reporting the, at the time. And the, and the Oregonians coverage was, was pretty good at the time that Kyron disappeared. Um, but an author just has the time to look in so many more places and talk to so many more uh, people than a than a daily reporter would have, um, but in both cases with the Susan Powell's parents and and Desiree Young, as I said, I I wrote to them, and an old fashioned letter in the mail, and I think I might have sent along one of my other books, and just really spoke from the heart about why I wanted why I wanted to do a book, um, you know, later when you're talking, you, you get into more depth about, you know, there's no money changing hands. I'm not paying, you know, reporters don't pay for sources, whether it's a book or, or a daily newspaper, there's no, there's no paying, there's no money. There's, you know, uh, uh, it's my book. And uh, so certain things have to be discussed at some point, but, it's, I think it's basically showing them, you know, here I worked with the Coxes for, for several years and Susan's friends in Utah, in Utah. And, I, you know, I just spent some time talking. And uh, when I went down to meet Desiree for the first day, for the first time in Portland, she didn't need prompting. She just talked for six hours or something when I was, when we were just meeting for the first time. So, um you know, most people in this situation uh, are very open. You know, I, I'm sure some families aren't, but most are very open, especially if they have a child missing. Yeah. You know, yeah. they they want they need to still get the word out. 
what about the community? Do they do are they as uh, do they sort of set up barriers when they see you walking around with a pad and pencil or whatever a recording or do do they clam up or do you have to cultivate them too? Well, you have to cultivate them, but uh, taking again the the Susan Powell book and the Kyron Horman book, when the families were on board, they told their relatives, their friends, their families, the friends of their kids, were please cooperate with Rebecca. I mean, I, I think there was some moment like that where they said, you know, we're cooperating in a book, please help her. And so when the parents and the family open the door, um, you know, that, that um, you, you can't do a book if nobody will speak to you. Okay, and so the parents can kind of uh, be helpful. I wanted to go back to another point you made that was really interesting, and that is the amount of research that a crime book yeah. requires. Um, do you just go out, I'm, I, is it a mechanistic approach? Do you just go out and read everything that you can find? Or do you, by then, since these crimes have probably similar for a while, do you have a, an angle that you, you want to take and then the facts kind mm -hmm. of fit into the angle? How do you, how do you approach your mm -hmm. research? Well, you don't know what you don't know. And I always accept that at the beginning. So I need to know everything, even if I learn things that don't fit in the book or that, that aren't important to it. I just um, think that I, I just need to find out about everything. Um, I, uh, I don't think that I usually look for an angle. There are certainly decisions you make as a, as a book writer, like how am I gonna begin this story? Does it begin at the beginning? Does it begin at the end? Maybe the book begins somewhere in the middle. Mm -hmm. And I'm very methodical about, about research. I mean, the first thing I would do is I'd read everything that's been written about it. And and then, you know, know court, that I have to check. Court transcripts? Would it include court, court transcripts? If there's been, but in both the um, Susan oh, Powell yes, case and the Chiron case, there's no, there is no court transcript. Right. There's no trial transcript if there's been no trial. Mm -hmm. And if it's an open case, like, Susan Powell and Kyron Horman, you don't even have the police case files. They do not share that oh. if it's an open case. Oh, so all you have is the people and um, and what has been what's been written before or said before. But it's um, it's fairly difficult to write a book without a case file. But well, Rebecca, you know you you, you put some challenges on yourself with <laughs> choosing these um, so I, but but they are compelling and I will say I I've read the book Boy Missing and it, it's heart wrenching but it's insightful. I want to ask you. you why did you choose to write about crime? What what initially it attracted you to this genre? Well there was that first story about the girl in Tacoma. Oh, I see. And the newspaper version of that was I found three families who had never uh, had an ending to their story. Uh, besides the Burr family in Tacoma, um, there was a woman in uh, Minnesota who three of her four boys disappeared one day, all in one day, and they were never found. That was in the 1960s. And uh, then a, a family in Washington State whose father was missing over Vietnam and whose family, you know, the, the government told them something different every day. Don't tell anybody he's missing. No, he's a POW. No, we think he's an MIA. Well, we think he was killed. Well, we don't know this. And his daughter got involved in, you know, testifying before Congress about, about how badly the government was handling POW families. And so the story was about when there's, when there's no ending, how do you, how do you go on? And, uh, but after that story, then that's when I kept visiting Anne Marie Burr's and mother. You sort of got sucked in it, and into, into it, and found out. Yeah, and then I met uh, I met Anne Rule, who invented true crime writing, by doing that book because she'd known Ted Bundy, and she wrote you know the first book about Ted Bundy, and uh, some doors opened, and I had an opportunity to 
to work on some other things and uh, all, all true crime related. And, and it just, it just, uh, it just took off. Well, we're coming to the end of the time and I do want to get a, um, a couple of more questions out. Um, are there crimes that you wouldn't consider doing? Mm -hmm. You know, that's a very good question. I like a mystery and, um, and uh, you know, who, why did this person commit this crime? What was the context of when it was committed? Who is the community? And I, I like things that have some kind of mystery, but I'm also, I can tell you what I'm not interested in. I, I wouldn't write about something that was really grisly. I uh, wouldn't write about the mafia. I don't have any interest in that. I wouldn't write another book about, you know, Charles Manson, um, you know, crimes that have been done a lot, done to death, I was going to say, uh, or, um, you know, I'm very interested in the context and the community in which a crime takes place. The Susan Powell, Susan Powell was Mormon, her family, her friends were Mormon, you know, she was uh, having domestic violence in her marriage, there was nowhere to go. I also have a book about uh, a murder among the Amish. It was just the second murder in yes. 250 years among the Amish. So communities that I can't step into, but I can try and learn as much about them. And, and they, and they share with me, even, you know, anonymously in the case of the Amish murder, um, uh, you know, how, how did the community? Um, yeah, that must've been the fascinating to tackle. Rebecca, uh, unfortunately, our time is up. Rebecca, thank you oh so much for spending this time with us and giving us, at least me, insights into crime writing that I never thought about. Fascinating. Thank uh, you, Caroline. You will come back on the on the nonfiction, and then we'll bat this this new subject of fiction and fact together again, right? Right, I will. Thank you. All right. Well, thank you for being with us mm -hmm. this afternoon, Rebecca. Such an int and I I do recommend the boy missing, but you know, have some Kleenex with you. Thank you again for uh, my audience for coming to spend a little time with us as we talk about books and writing. We publish about every two months. So if you don't want to miss out on these wonderful topics, of these wonderful writers, please sign up, please subscribe. We don't sell names, we don't sell advertising, and you can jump in and off as rapidly as you like. But anyway, I hope you've enjoyed today's discussion as much as I have, and sadder and wiser, as they say. And again, Rebecca, you've been a delight. And to my audience, see you next time. <laughs>